Well done. Emma and I have 11 children and uh, five of them were born basically on the road in, in a vehicle with just the two of us present and the other kids. Um, and that worked out really well, avoiding the hospitals. I was an only child. Things were really quiet. I was kind of lonely, but things were really quiet. Now I'm not lonely. I've got lots of people around me, which is great, and it's really noisy. So sometimes we, we wear earmuffs. My wife and I wear earmuffs inside because of the kids' noise, it's so loud. But, so I recommend earmuffs as number one parental tool. We live in Pataru, uh, which is great because I'm basically the only surfer in town. So, so we, we came out here solely because it was cheap. Very happy with it. Excellent water. We've got the blue spring water coming through the tap for free. Great people. It's an hour and a bit to each coast. Uh, air is nice. I just like the size of the town. I wouldn't live here uh, if there's no internet. It would just be diabolical. But the internet's great. You can live in a cave anywhere, just about, and, and still be totally in, in touch. <laughs> I got into surfing for the same sort of reasons and influences that most young fellows did. The magazines. <laughs> so that's where it started, but we deviated from that eventually. I was forced to become a, an apprentice carpenter when I left school. To, because when I left school, I, my friends and I, we were hell-bent on doing nothing but surfing, so I was taken by the ear and made to get a job as a carpenter. So I got some experience working with wood in a, in a primitive sense. <laughs> what started me shaping my own boards was simply that I couldn't get what I wanted. It was back in the, what am I, 95? Still basically the thruster era. I'd go and get to get a single pin made and the shapers would sort of turn up their nose and sort of reluctantly do it. So I had a quiver of old single pins because I was always just a single pin freak. But they were getting battered so I just thought I'd just have a go, you know. And then we kind of thought about it for a while and thought I wanted to use wood because I didn't want to bother with the phone being around me, I didn't want to be around the chemicals, so I said, oh, we'll use some balsa wood. And we were sort of mulling over that for a while, and then one day I was just, I was in Raglan, at this place in Daisy Street, and I was standing there looking at the harbour, and suddenly in front of me floated, it was like a vision floated uh, the parallel profile, which is what we do, which is the board's the same thickness from nose to tail, and it's laminated with X number of layers over a mould. And I, I, I saw this thing floating in front of me, flexing, like kind of like a diving board. And it was just one of those flashes of inspiration. So we took it from there, did it. And I, the first one I drew, it looked so ugly and so unusual that I was like, no, I can't do that. Because it would just, everyone will just bag it, it won't be accepted and whatnot. But I went ahead anyway, just to see what it was like. I've used a lot of uh, different woods, cedar, redwood, poplar, balsa wood, quite a few others, um, but polonia is probably the best surfboard wood ever, so um, it's a bit of a gift really to the surfboard community I think, it's really great. It's got the highest strength to weight ratio of any wood in the world and it resists salt water so if you get a ding it doesn't really suck water, so it's, it's good in that respect. And it's nice to work with. It's fast growing and um, we grow them in the backyard and the leaves make good stock food that's got good medicinal properties and improves the soil so it's the best wood around I think. Hollow surfboards really need to be vented so they don't get pressure build up because as temperatures change they can get pressure on the inside or vacuum which can cause structural issues, so it's a good idea to put a, a vent in them. And uh, it's nice to keep some air moving when they're out of the water to keep the wood sweet. So that's what we do. I use big hand operated ones, like inspection ports. They're actually, uh, they're called deck fillers for boats. So they're normally used for fuel or water or waste. 
So we use those because they've got a nice big opening and it's good to be able to just open them when you need to. So sometimes if I get out the back, uh, it's been a hot day and the water's cold, the air will shrink and you'll get a bit of a vacuum. So I just open the vent briefly, equalise the pressure. It's sort of like a whale that breathes, you know, you come out of the water and open it. It's just gives a whoosh. Yeah, the sunboard is the longest surfboard at 19 feet. Um, the next longest one is 17 feet, which I've ridden a lot. I've ridden the 17 footer a lot. Uh, it's really nice. The swell riding and long distance traveling on the coast in <laughs> small waves. Uh, the shortest, we make little pythos and lie boards and things for the kids. Um, in fact, all these long boards are really, to me, a short board is long board, right? Because I just didn't get into the board walking thing at all. So when I wanted a longer board, I just wanted it to ride like my 70 single fin, only catch waves better and do all the other things that long boards do. So that's what they've evolved from. So I don't have to muck around traipsing up and down the board. It just still feels like what a short board used to feel like, although longer lines. Well, it's quite a long process making them. Uh, sometimes eight months, sometimes three months, sometimes two months. But in terms of hours, um, a 12 foot is probably 200 hours. But I don't time clock myself. I mean, there's a lot of time spent examining what you're doing or talking about it or just looking at it uh, or designing or having cups of tea. And, but it is a lot of work, yeah. So if you've got five or six people, it's a lot quicker and better. Because the resin goes off, so you mix some resin, you want to get it done before it starts going hard. The boards have definitely evolved, um, not just in length. Uh, the length's a big one though. It just makes them so much more capable over a wide range of conditions. I mean, people are aware of that with long boards, but uh, we've sort of taken it much further. <laughs> Speed in surfing is, is vital. If you're not moving, then you're not surfing. So more speed means more sections you can make, whatever. So uh, everyone likes to have speed, but often they won't get as much as they could because they don't want to sacrifice other things, like some of the turns and things they want to do, and tricks and stuff. Well, it's, it's minimalist. I, I, I like to eliminate what's not necessary, which most people think is very odd because they subscribe to this idea that surfing is fun and it's fun to do tricks and it's fun to do turns all the time and that sort of thing. Uh, so they don't get it, but by, by stripping away all the unnecessary stuff, what you're left with is a greater ability to make waves. So that's why I do it. I just like to make more waves go further, faster if possible, with less effort. So the whole thing just becomes like a, a sort of a, a zone, just a, a chill zone where you're just med in a meditative state, really. I've been surfing Raglan quite a bit since the 70s, you know, as a, as a blow-in. But um, I got married and my wife had a section there, so we, we built a house there in, in Whale Bay surfed the place for three years and partied and surfed and partied and surfed and partied and surfed every day. Uh, well, not partying every day, but surfing every day. I've got a bit of a thing for the point at Murray Bay now. Longboards, I think, are nicer for the point because um, you've got, it fades out to deep water, which makes it a little bit more pleasant in that respect. And uh, indicators is nice outsides, but the point, I think, um, a friend early on said to me, he said, hey, you know, the point is actually the best wave of the, of the three. And I think he might be right. But I'm not sure if I believe in all this global travel stuff. Any, any day I spend in Hawaii is a day I'm missing out on in New Zealand, so I can't see why I would. There's so many waves here I can't catch already that I'd just rather catch more waves in New Zealand. I just, like back in the, in the 70s, you know, the dream was to go and find the perfect wave. Basically, what that meant was that the surfboards that were available only rode those kind of waves properly. So you had, if you didn't find those waves, you're left sitting on the beach. So everyone had to go and travel to Bali, Australia, whatever, to go and find a perfect wave. 
Well, I haven't really followed that route. I did it for a bit in New Zealand, but now I just try and make the board fit the way 